All right, you should be able to see my slides now. So let me start us, I always take us here just to remind us that the Sermon on the Mount is part of a larger piece. Don't forget the Sermon on the Mount does not stand alone. It's part of the Gospel of Matthew. And so Matthew will be interpreting points for us along the way in the way he tells his story. And we'll see some of that perhaps today as we look at um, some of the points that are made here. Because really, if you want to understand the section that we're in now, it does you, um, it's worth the time to go to over to um, chapter 23 and get his um, condemnation of the Pharisees. Because there's a lot of stuff that shows up in this text that wouldn't have shown up in the text had there not been the Pharisaic discussions going on behind the text. We'll explore that as we go a bit. I want to give you a bit of an outline of the Sermon on the Mount. I want you to notice that the sermon starts with a comment on who's there and that the sermon at the end of chapter seven actually ends with a comment of the response of those people who are there. And so the, the whole text is bookend by kind of a, a, some attention to the audience. We've read the Beatitudes, and I have suggest to you that they're blessings on undeserving. I didn't use that word in that original presentation, but undeserving disciples, because it's not based upon their greatness. But it's in their, in their poverty of spirit, in their purity of heart, that Jesus considers them blessed. And then the next part of the text dealt with discipleship, where Jesus does one more beatitude that clearly doesn't belong to the balance set uh, at the beginning of Matthew. But it said, blessed are you if you're persecuted because of me. And then that's followed immediately with what are kind of announcements of discipleship, your salt and light. I've called the next section, which is largely the rest of chapter five, as the righteousness that exceeds. That comes from Jesus's own language. And Jesus makes this comment about how he's come to not abolish, but fulfill. I want to revisit that a little bit as we go into the next section. And surpassing the old, that may not be the best way to frame it for Matthew, but it works. There's a comment, I think it's about Matthew 10, that a scribe, that is, a religious leader, a scribe who enters the kingdom of God, brings treasures both old and new. And so Matthew's actually conscious of the fact that people are part of an old way of being versus kind of a new way of being. So, so I'm going to call these, Bill, you may appreciate this, not extensions, not antitheses. I'm going to call them six interpretations. And that gives us a more neutral word to talk about what Jesus does, because he doesn't exactly do the same thing in each of these each of, these, uh, each of these elements. And I'm going to suggest to you that Jesus actually deals with one, two, three, four, five topics, not six as it's often divided. And I'll tell you why I'm thinking that. The conversation about divorce is actually a sub-congregation or a sub-conversation to adultery. And I'll show you why I think that from a, from a structural point of view. So. And then what follows that is kind of a description of true righteousness where Jesus deals with giving, prayer, and fasting. So quite, um, in the ancient world, quite visible forms of acts of mercy. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you may remember Jesus saying. And then there's a section that we're going to talk about here in the next couple of weeks about I've called the section trusting God, but it deals about it deals with the notion of putting our investments in God rather than wealth and how we deal with anxieties, which I think this fits nicely under the theme of what does it mean to trust God as a disciple? And then, hey, seven, one through 12, just various teachings. There might be a, a single theme to put it under. Um Discernment might not be a bad place to put all of the various teachings on discernment. I don't know, but, but uh, we've got basically four kind of texts that, that we're going to look at there. And then in the end, we come to the conclusion, and Jesus ends with a very Jewish way of doing a sermon of any kind, and he talks about the two ways. And basically, if you read all of these, all of these stories tie together because they're built around 
distinguishing the false from the real, hypocrisy from sincerity. And so the contrast between there's a way of life and there's a way of death kind of holds these four uh, or these five together. There are true prophets, false prophets. You see how that works. Let me share a little bit from the Mishnah. The Mishnah is a document that is composed, we don't really know for sure, but about 200 years after Jesus. It's a Jewish document. And it is, it is a document that's fairly large. In fact, uh, my English translation is some 700 pages. And so not my personal one, but the one I own. I haven't personally translated the Mishnah. So I don't, but the Mishnah is a collection of Jewish traditions, some of which no doubt go all the way back to the time of Jesus. The challenge with the Mishnah is you got to be careful not to read something from a later time into the earlier time. And so there's, there's, in fact, you'll see how the Mishnah is going to be helpful in another conversation here. But the Mishnah is a compilation of Jewish tradition, largely what survives out of what we might call the end of the Pharisees. And right after the Pharisees, the tradition becomes, because, uh, becomes a, re, a rabbinic tradition. So the Pharisaic tradition does live on after the year of 70 when the Jewish temple is destroyed, but then it in, increasingly it's tied to rabbis. But we do get, you can read the Mishnah and get a sense of the kind of debate Jewish rabbis would have uh, in the first century. Okay. Uh, another collection of Jewish uh, tradition is called the Talmud. The Talmud is a much more comprehensive body of literature, and it covers kind of the whole of early tradition, but it also covers a much later tradition on into the Middle Ages. So, and so basically, there's a large body of literature out there that allows you to tap in kind of Jewish ways of thinking. And if you want to be put to sleep really easily at night, just grab some of this stuff. And, and, and the saying is something like where you have two Jews, you have three opinions. And because what you find out about Jewish tradition, I don't mean to be disparaging at all. I'm just saying that, that in Jewish tradition, the debate was more important than the conclusion. You get that? So the, having the debate, having the conversation. Well, anyway, this comes from one of the Mishnahs. Moses received Torah at Sinai and handed it on to Joshua. Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets, and the prophets handed it on to the men of the great assembly, basically talking about the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. They said three things. So here's three values. Be prudent in judgment, raise up many disciples, and make a fence for the Torah. The notion of a fence was not an attempt to make it it was not an attempt to make it more of a legal document the way we tend to read the old testament it's basically saying the torah is god's word and if there are things we can do that keeps us from crossing god's word we ought to do that and so um amy jill levine whom i'm reading right now is kind of a side conversation on the sermon on the mount she comes out of she's a, a Christian, but she comes out of Jewish tradition, and so she kind of knows this stuff instinctively. When she reads the Sermon on the Mount, and particularly the section we're getting into, she sees Jesus continuing the debate of first-century Pharisaic Judaism. And by the way, if you'll compare Matthew five with Matthew twenty-three, you can actually feel it and see it. So for some reason, the gospel of Matthew is the gospel that is, is in the most touch or most contact with the Pharisees. And so lots of comments come out of that. It's, okay, if Jesus is interpreting scripture, let's read the next text again together. Do not think that I've come to abolish, that is to remove, to wipe out, the law or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but I've come to fulfill them. Fulfill needs to be fleshed out because in, in our mind, it's we think prophecy, prediction, fulfillment. Jesus has something, I think, a little fuller in mind. For truly, amen. That's the, that's the word, amen, amen, that Jesus says sometimes. So it means I'm saying something really important, amen. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappears, not the smallest letter 
not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Notice Jesus is actually talking about the text of scripture. And that it goes until everything is accomplished. Till the end of time, perhaps, or till the end of Jesus's ministry. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll let that one soak a little bit. Matthew doesn't explain it here. Therefore, and notice the therefore here is now a reason given for what he just said. Notice the therefore puts this as a sub point under what was just said. Anyone who sets aside one of the least of these, and what does he mean by these as opposed to those? Think about it. The least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be great, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses, exceeds that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the laws, normally translated scribes, you will not, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's a pretty, pretty bold thing Jesus says here. So one of the things I want you to notice as we go through these is just think, why does Jesus choose these commands as opposed to all the others? A little bit later in the in the Mishnaic, the Mishnah tradition, it's understood that Jesus, that the Old Testament contains 613 commands. That's kind of the number that's thrown around. I've never actually tried to count them. I've never figured out exactly how they're counted, but let's say that there are 613 to go with the tradition. Jesus chooses to talk about certain ones, and to my surprise, they're not all from the Ten Commandments. And so he's not dealing with just the Ten Commandments, although he does deal with several from the Ten Commandments. Here's another comment from, uh, from Amy Jill Levine, who's giving us her, her Jewish perspective. When Jesus speaks of fulfilling this material, he's not suggesting that once he says or does something related to the ancient text, that text can be regarded as both checked off and checked out. That makes sense, right? Although it's easy for us to think that way. Jesus asserts that scripture of Israel remains sacred for his followers. That's not the general usual take in Protestantism on this topic, but I think she's right. When Jesus speaks of fulfilling the Torah, he signals that he's drawing out its full implications. How's that for a notion of fulfillment? And so there's no doubt that the scripture of Israel remains sacred for the church. In fact, most of the New Testament can be seen, at least at some level, interpretations of the Old Testament. In fact, your Bibles have conveniently today set off Old Testament quotes in poetic structure usually. And so when you can just flip through your Bible and, and see how many, your New Testament, you can see how many Old Testament texts are being referenced. And when, when the New Testament writers want to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, they do it from the Old Testament text. Okay, good. You're with. Yeah. So I want you to think in terms of fulfilling is that Jesus fulfills the story. For example, when Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness in a temptation, and he's met by the devil, and he's tempted by the devil, Jesus is fulfilling the full implication of the testing of the, in the wilderness. He's basically replicating the story of Israel in his own life. Or when you read uh, Mark's story of the crucifixion, you can hardly read it without reference to Psalm 22, where Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is a direct quote from Psalm 22, which is like the, um, the way, basically Mark is telling you in his narrative, oh, by the way, Jesus quoted Psalm 22. It might be good to read the whole of Psalm 22 before you get into this text. And if you do, you will have an amazing experience connecting Psalm 22 to the cru crucifixion of Jesus. It's not that the original psalmist didn't have a real experience. It's just now that the psalmist, now that we have Psalm 22 and the crucifixion of Jesus, we read the story differently, connected. Okay. Ready to move on, guys? Here, and I think this is really important. If you get the structure of the next several texts, you'll read them more intelligently. 
And so I hope I've done a, a fair enough job here to suggest these texts start with, you have heard that it was said, and they consistently do that in verse 21, 27, 33, 38, and 43, but not in 31. If you've got a Bible that you can flip to real quick, look at what happens in 31. Can everybody see that? In verse 31, it does not say you have heard that it was said. It says something similar, but it's not in the same rhythm as the earlier ones. I'm going to suggest to you, this is, Mar this is Matthew's way of saying, oh, by the way, this is not a new topic. It is a continuation of the topic we were just on. Because he's basically giving you markers that where you have, you have heard that it was said. I take those as kind of paragraph markers. They mark off each of the sections for you. Okay, and so the basic structure is this. You have heard that it was said, and generally what happens next is a commandment. And it's often a verbatim commandment. So it's pretty much tr taken straight from uh, the Old Testament. And then sometimes, sometimes there is an expansive phrase, either summarizing the law, or we suspect maybe an interpretation with Pharisaic oral tradition of the first century. It's where Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you should love your um, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemies. Well, there's no text that says hate your enemies. It's expansive. And then there is the but, and I want to, um, I want to give you just a little bit of Greek grammar here, only enough that doesn't hurt you. I don't want to hurt anybody. But there are two um, um, conjunctions that we translate in the English language as but. And so just, just because it's humorous to college students, I will say there is the big butt and there is the little butt. Laughs, right? Okay. The big butt is a strong contrast. And it is the Greek word. Don't confuse this with the name of God, but it's the Greek word Allah, A-L-L-A. -A -A -L -L -A. Yeah, it's. It's not Allah as in Arabic. It is a Greek word that means but. And when we use that word, we means we're making a really strong contrast. And then, guys, there's the little tiny but. And the little tiny but is something that could be translated as and, moreover, furthermore, in the same vein. Okay, so... So Jesus here in all of these structures is not making, it says this, but he's saying, it says this, but let's go a little deeper. That's what I think Jesus is doing with these is let's go a little deeper. Is that helpful? Because the way we read it is when we read it as antithesis, we're saying, we're saying that the word here ought to be the Allah word, which means, but here it's more like you've heard that it was said now. I want to say, by the way, now is actually a good way to translate this. It can be translated now in the logical sense, not the time sense. And so here's what, I, here's what I'm going to suggest, and we can play with this as we begin to work with the various interpretations here, is that, uh, that Jesus will put the command and some oral interpretation if that's what's going on there. And then he will, he will give us what I think is a more penetrating interpretation that doesn't deny the commandment, but actually makes it more important. Jesus is largely moving the command from an external action to an internal matter of the heart. And so you'll see that happening. And then what happens next after Jesus gives us his interpretation is he offers us either examples or explanation. And let me push one more thing just a little bit deeper. He is not always speaking literally. Right. right. And we'll see that as, as it plays out, but it takes us a little bit to get there as we work with it. And so basically every text that we're about to study follows this basic pattern. And so this, rem remember this basic pattern as a way of thinking, okay, what's going on in each of these texts as Jesus is doing his teaching? 
particularly since we've got this very clear parallel structure. You ready to play with one? Yeah. All right. Let's 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 deal with murder. You want to deal with murder? You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. By the way, that part is actually command. I mean, you can find the text. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. That's something of an interpretation. But notice Jesus has said, you've heard that it was said to people long ago. So it's part of the tradition of the day. So he's teaching out of the Old Testament text, but he's also preaching in light of the tradition. Okay? Right. But there is no text that actually says, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. We'll we'll talk about that here in a minute. Then Jesus says, but moreover, I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So he's basically taking the text that was just previously said that applied it to murder. And he says, hey, I want to tell you that if you're angry with your brother or sister, you're subject to judgment. And what happens next is now illustrations of that point. Again, anyone who says to to a brother or sister, raka, which is an Aramaic word that means you empty headed one. Raka just sounds so much more insulting, doesn't it? Raka is answerable to the Sanhedrin. By the way, your English translations go with court here because it's trying to put it in a general context. But Jesus actually uses the word for the Jewish council of the elders, the 70 members of the council of elders composed of Sadducees and Pharisees. Why would Jesus use the word for the Jewish council if he's teaching moral teaching, because that's the context that he's in. Does he actually literally mean that if you say raka to somebody, you're going to be hauled before the Sanhedrin? Probably not. He's overstating his case. I want you to see this because it's going to help you read some of the difficult stuff that's coming. If you said raka to somebody in the ancient world, nobody's going to take you to the court. But Jesus says, if you, if you take this position, and anyone who says you fool, moron, in Greek, you will be in the dangers of the fire of hell. And here Jesus uses the word Gehenna. We'll talk a little bit more about well, this word for hell. He's giving his disciples way to remember that if you want to deal with murder, you've got to handle anger. Right. Yeah. So he's basically saying for our community of people, we don't even call people empty headed or fools. We don't do that. And then notice that what follows after this in verse 23 is two case examples. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remembers that your brother or sister has something against you, by the way, not that you have something against them, but that you remember somebody has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar First go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gifts. Remember Jesus' use of Hosea 6.6, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. How does this text, notice the therefore there, which means that there is a linkage to the previous text. Had, uh, Had an old professor from Abilene Christian who used to say, when you find a therefore, you need to find why it's therefore. Well, it's connecting this. So how does this connect with anger? It doesn't take much thinking about it to see how it connects with how do you deal with anger in the community? Well, it means even if you remember that somebody has something against you, you take the first move. Notice the Jewish context. If you're offering your gift at the altar, If you're bringing a sacrifice to the altar, it's more important for you to be reconciled to your brothers and sisters than it is to offer that gift. So he is reinterpreting some typical ways of thinking about how things are. And I love the fact that the burden is, 
and folks, I hear this too, too often. I'm not going to forgive them because they haven't asked for it. That is not the Christian way, my friend. Jesus is offering his community a different way of handling anger. Or let's take another example. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. By the way, this is not the, the, the word for, um, for Sanhedrin here. It's a regular word for, for court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out of there until you have paid the last penny. Now, Jesus is talking proverbially here. He's not saying that every time you have a conflict, it's going to go to court. And he's not saying every time you go to court, you're going to be squeezed for every dollar. But notice what he is trying to teach us. That when we are in conflict with another, we handle it early, not late. Does that look like a good summary? And so Jesus is teaching us not He's, not, he's giving us case examples that we're supposed to extrapolate out and apply in our lives. Does that make sense? The exact, the exact circumstances may not be exactly what's envisioned in the text, but if I've got a conflict with somebody and I can settle it before it goes to mediation, that might be the way to do it. So what does Jesus teach us about dealing with our dealing with our well he starts with murder he says if you don't want to murder uh make sure you don't um uh make sure you deal with your anger by the way don't call each other names because that won't get you down the road and if you do have a conflict with a brother or sister would you would you make sure you take care of that before you come to church and if you're in conflict right now, is there a way for you to resolve it before it gets to courts or mediation? And so Jesus is offering kind of a different way of handling life. Which, by the way, is sorely needed in our culture. That's why I call this Jesus's politic. Jesus, uh, Paul will have to deal in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 with a church that's actually taking each other to court. And he says, guys, we should do that. We should. In fact, I think he's reflecting Jesus's teaching. When we take each other to court, we're saying we're not the community that we've been called to be. At the end of each of these, I've given you just some, uh, some notes on each of the text. And so the commandment itself is found in Exodus 20, verse 13. And Deuteronomy uh, 5, verse 17. By the way, the Ten Commandments show up in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. The original Hebrew term here is for murder, and we need to distinguish that from killing. Just so we're precise here, Jesus is, is not addressing the topic of killing in general. He's talking about, uh, in this text, he's dealing with a command that deals with the intentional um, act of taking another's lives. So... And so it comes more at the personal level instead of the societal level. The notion that uh, anyone who murders will be subject to judgment could be a summary of what you actually find in the Old Testament. For example, Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds human blood by human, sh by human shall their blood be shed. And for, for in the image of God, God has made mankind so that we find out that the reason murder is forbidden is because when we kill someone, we, uh, we take the life of someone who's created in the image of God, which also creates a bit of a problem for the one who's killed because that person is also created in the image of God. So what do you do with him? Okay. Uh, and murder is, is a capital offense. It's obviously, if you murder somebody, you will, your life will be taken. So all of these are part of kind of the, kind of the, uh, the Old Testament background. So in, in, in this first one, we see that Jesus is willing to say in some uh, pretty astonishing ways, there is a different way for the disciples of Jesus, for Jesus's new community, for Jesus's community to live. Okay, let's play with the more difficult one. You ready for this? I probably shouldn't use the word play and adultery together. That's probably an inappropriate choice of connections, but You've heard that it was said, 
you shall not commit adultery. Well, you can find that one. It's one of the Ten Commandments. So guess where you're going to find it? Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. And then Jesus says after that, this is his interpretive move. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. The word here is Gehenna. I'll pick that up here in a little bit. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Okay, what's, what catches me by surprise here is that Jesus' solution will not solve the problem of lust. Wouldn't the, wouldn't the next logical move be that if I've lusted, if I've, if I've done it in my heart, then I should pluck out my heart. And by the way, I could ask all of us to raise our hands, and I've noticed that I've got both of mine, and you've got both of yours, so nobody's actually read this text at a literal level. because we. So what is Jesus doing with this way of speaking? It's hyperbole, isn't it? It's a little bit overly enthusiastic. We instinctively know when we get to this text that we need to read Jesus a little differently. And so here's my, here's my, here's my interpretation. This is so serious that you need to deal with it as if you had a hand that offended you or a body part and you needed to cut it off. And so he's basically saying, get the gangrene out of the house. How's that for kind of one way of, of looking at what Jesus is? But Jesus has certainly raised the stakes. And by the way, this is a, a word that needs to be said in our time, in our culture. When he moves the notion of adultery to even looking after a woman. And by the way, he noticed that he's basically in the culture of his day. Uh, I don't think uh, Jesus intended for this to be just addressed to men. And so if you want to apply it both ways, you're fine. But he's dealing with kind of the culture of the day. It has been said. This is a side conversation. It, it's not you've been uh, you have heard that it was said. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. This is Deuteronomy 24. We'll give some attention to it here in a bit. But I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife and Let's not read the exception clause right now. Let's pull it out. Anyone, that, anyone who divorces his wife makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Literal or hyperbole? Well, I think it's serious, but not necessarily what we would call literal, because let's, let's, let's do this. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife makes her the victim of adultery. Does divorce alone make your wife the victim of adultery? If your husband's looked lustfully after another, then one of the qualifications for being able to divorce is that adultery has happened. What I want to show you guys is that this is not always as on the surface as a reading as we think it is. And I want us to be very careful with this material because I think the church has done a lot of damage to people by hearing it so literally that, for example, the next text says that, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife makes her the victim of adultery. So it's her fault somehow she was implicated in it. All I want to do at this point, uh, folks, is, is to show you how this text and by the way, we've not even dealt with except for sexual immorality. Uh, that I think Jesus may be overstating his case to suggest that when we treat people this way, we do not treat them in the image of God. Is it, can we go that far? 
Because what we've done in church life sometimes is we've made divorce this unforgivable sin, and we leave people with the sense that if a relationship didn't work out the way they thought, then then my life's doomed and I can't move forward. Is Jesus doing that? And that doesn't seem to be consistent with, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, does it? Here's what you have in uh, Deuteronomy. By the way, the punishment for David, we'll, we'll kind of circle around that for a bit. Um, in the Old Testament, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteresses are to be put to death. What's interesting is we don't know how many times in Israel that was actually practiced. And the one time that Jesus was called on to be part of this conversation, only the woman was brought to him. And so in some sense, if Old Testament legislation was, was played out over and over again, you would expect a whole lot more uh, men and women being put to death. So in, what, in some ways, in some ways, there's a built-in protection because you actually have to catch someone doing it in order to bring them uh, forward. But the other thing I want to want to keep in mind is when Jesus says uh, lust after a woman or lust at a woman, then the term there is the, the regular Greek word for, for epithemia. It's the regular word for lust. And the Septuagint renders the Ten Commandments this was the word for coveting. And so whoever covets might be, might be the connection of, of how this fits with the Ten Commandments and coveting. Okay, let's try to get our heads in the first century debate. And for me, there's kind of two conversations here. There is uh, the debate that was going on in Jesus's day, and then there's the very hard issues of uh, how we do pastoral care today. I want to I want to say I, I feel the tensions of both every time I dive into this material. Right. The discussion around adultery and divorce is in the context of a Pharisaic debate that's going on in the first century. And I've given you samples from Matthew 19. By the way, this is not the only text where the whereby um, Jesus deals with the topic of, of adultery and divorce, particularly divorce. Some Pharisees came to test him and they asked, is it lawful, interesting choice of words, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason, for any cause? So part of the debate is the lawfulness of the grounds for divorce. Later on in that same text, why then did Moses, or why then, they asked Jesus, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? This is a little, a little slightly off stated because Jesus did not actually, I mean, Moses did not actually command that. That's not exactly what the command is. We'll take a, a look here at the command. And then at the end, Matthew 19:9. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman commits adultery. I want us to kind of listen to this text. Let's pull out the exception clause. I tell you that if anyone divorces his wife and marries another, commits adultery. Okay, the action here is, if I'm understanding the text, is not just divorcing your wife. It's divorcing your wife and marrying another. And I'm going to go so far to say that the debate in the first century meant divorcing your wife so you could marry another is included in this. Okay, let's try to hear Deuteronomy 24. That's, that's the text that's being reflected on. Deuteronomy 24 is a mouthful. And so I've highlighted in red enough of the text that you can follow the flow of the text. If a woman marries, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent, ervat devar is the Hebrew there, about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce. Notice it's not a command. It's a matter of procedure. And gives it to her and sends her from his house 
And if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. So here's what the command actually said. If a man marries the woman, he sends her away and she becomes another man's wife, then she can never become the first man's wife again. So this creates an interesting debate in first century Judaism over what the indecent thing is that I've called, or I've spelled out here kind of the Hebrew. What's this indecent thing? Well, here's where Jewish tradition is going to help us a little bit. This comes from the Mishnah, by the way. There are two debating views in first century Palestine. And by the way, Hillel lives in the first century. Hillel is the teacher of the apostle Paul. So we do at least have some rootage that this is first century stuff. And the house of Shammai, one, one school of rabbinic interpretation is that Ervat Devar, which literally means the word of nakedness, the matter of nakedness, refers to adultery and makes divorce, divorce permissible only on that grounds. What's interesting here is that this comes out of the fact that adultery didn't always get you stoned. Otherwise, you wouldn't be making this argument. Okay. But anyway, divorce is only permissible because obviously if, you're, if, you're, if your unfaithful mate is, is, is uh, stoned, then you're free to marry again because you're not married, right? So one house said, no, what, what's in mind here in this text is a matter, the Hebrew word for word, the matter of nakedness, that's kind of the literal, refers to someone being sexually unfaithful to the marriage. The house of Hillel is actually a little more liberal in its interpretation. And for any reason, basically, in fact, uh, the Mishnah says, even if she spoiled his dish, Rabbi Akabai, that's part of this same tradition, says, even if he found someone prettier than she. What you need to hear behind Jesus' comments is this debate that is going on. And basically, it boils down to this. Can I divorce someone and with the purpose, even, of marrying someone else? And of course, Jesus roots this thing hard in the reading of Genesis, not, not the reading of the law, but the reading of Genesis that in fact, that this, this relationship is intended for life. So I don't want to back off on the pressure there, there David. I just, want us, I just want us to be able to hear some of the other things that are going on behind the scenes. And now let me give you one more, one more interpretive problem. Let's try to figure out what irvat devar means. By the way, the word devar is the uh, Hebrew word for word, word which can also be translated matter. This matter of nakedness, if you only had Deuteronomy 24, would seem like something like sexual unfaithfulness. However, the word has a broader application to something disgusting. And so this is one of the reasons in the first century, what does this, what does this um, on the grounds of a matter of nakedness after actually means? Well, that's why it was open to debate. What's interesting is that in Matthew's text, in Matthew 5, Matthew says the matter of fornication or the matter of sexual immorality. He, he uses the Greek word lagu, that is logos, the word of, of sexual immorality. I'm going to just go with the broad, which seems to be an echo of the phrase from Deuteronomy. You'll... Notice that in Mark, that exception clause doesn't show up. But it does in Matthew. And I'm wondering if because of the Jewish nature of the conversation, that's the reason it's a, the expanded form ends up in Matthew, not Mark. Because if you're reading Mark, you're hearing Jesus say there's absolutely no good reason for a divorce. Here you're getting that exception clause, which may be this. 
The problem is uh, in interpretation is that the word porneia, which is the word for sexual immorality, it's really broad. It's not, it's not necessarily, oh, they committed adultery because they were in another relationship. They're doing something that is sexually inappropriate. And so it is about the broadest word in the Greek language you can come up with sexual acting out in morality. I don't know that I'm going to resolve for you, you know, what constitutes fornication? Does the fact that your husband's lusted after someone give you grounds for divorce because he's committed adultery in his heart? I don't think that's the way Jesus is headed for in, in his teaching. Let's go back and see if we can't hear Jesus again. Now that we've got a little bit of background, Jesus, you have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery. Adultery is, of course, violating your faithfulness to your marriage vows, uh, particularly by having a relationship with another, right? But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in, her, in the heart. Now, we've seen Jesus do this. He goes from the outside to the inside. And then he says this, uh, again, he's talking about this lustfully looking thing, isn't he? If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell or into Gehenna. I don't know about you, but that's obviously telling Folks, this is a pretty serious topic. But this comment in verse 29 is about uh, lustfully looking, not adultery. It's deeper than lustfully looking. I mean, it's deeper than adultery. Is that fair in our reading here? And then Jesus makes this comment. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. I think Jesus is picking up the interpretation of the first century because we looked at Deuteronomy 24 and 24 makes this as part of the procedure, not the command. The command is that woman can never go back to the first husband. That's the command. Yeah. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife makes her the victim of adultery. Um, we might want to pull the word victim out because the makes her an adulteress actually is kind of the, the way the translation would work. I think the English is trying to uh, minimize the fact that this woman herself hasn't committed the adultery. And if anyone marries a divorced woman, uh, anyone that marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, I think the question for the interpreter to work through is, is Jesus stating the literal reality or is he sta overstating the case to make his point as he has in the other? That's where I think you've got the tension in terms of trying to interpret it. Because we can show that Jesus in the earlier text is using something of an overstatement to make his point. Now, let me remind you that these are not the last words here, but I think what Jesus' first audience would have heard is that God doesn't really make an exception for divorce. And if there is an exception, it's on the ground of this porneia, which then was the point of the debate in the first century. What does that look like? What is that about? I heard an interpretation one time that I think would make Jesus consi uh, perfectly consistent that uh, the early Christians did not believe there was a ground for divorce. That was not their way. Now, of course, that creates some interesting challenges on the other side. What do you do with folks who are already divorced? Well, by the way, the early church did have to deal with that, and they found a place for them in the community. And you can actually find that with a careful reading of 1 Corinthians 7. There is a group of people called the unmarried that are the unmarried, not the virgins. And so... And so at one level, I think you, you're going to find that, by the way, the early church actually valued folks who once the mate died, stayed single. You'll find that being expressed to some degree in the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy and Titus. So that's the, the husband of one wife is actually translated married only once, which, by the way, given the uh, background in ancient culture, could be, could be exactly the read. And we know from other writers in the post-apostolic period that the sanctity of marriage was held high in the ancient Christian community. 
And so Jesus' disciples are going to respond to this teaching with the response, if this is the way it is with a person and his spouse, uh, why should anybody even get married? So they hear Jesus at the highest level. And I think what's being played out in these texts is that we should treat people based on our relationships with loyalty, with covenant loyalty. And in our marriage relationships, we should treat that as covenant loyalty. And so in some ways, I would suggest that Jesus will use marriage in Matthew 19 and Mark 10 as a case example of discipleship. Discipleship is a covenant loyalty for life. And so if I were to, again, there's so much I wish I knew more about this particular text, but if I was to summarize it, I would say, if you're the kind of individual that's trying to get out of your covenant relationship with your spouse, then you're on the, that's not the kind of people Jesus is forming. Jesus is forming people who keep covenant, their marriage relationships, but they are, Jesus is also forming a, a, a community of people that are dealing with their wayward thoughts, their lust, their coveting. Again, it's hard to have this conversation just from Matthew 5 because there's also Matthew 19 you want to look at. There's Mark 10. There's a little sayings in, in uh, Luke chapter, I think it's 15 or 16. And then there's Paul's stuff in 1 Corinthians 7 to kind of get a robust kind of New Testament understanding of how to manage these, manage these relationships. So at, what is Jesus teaching? If you want to deal with adultery, deal with the stupid stuff you're doing in your head. Pay attention to what you're coveting. And by the way, the two, the two teachings, in, at, the, at least at this level, the murder teaching and the adultery teaching kind of comes together to say, it's not the action that is going to get you in trouble. It is the internal process. It is, you want to deal with murder, you deal with anger. If you want to deal with adultery, you deal with lust. Which, by the way, remember, that's the word that's translated in the Septuagint for covet. Or I would say deal with your desires, which is a great translation of the word epithemia, the word for lust. Folks, we've actually gone longer than I expected because this, this, is, this is a hard one, and I'm sure I've left loose ends. And so, but what I want to encourage you to do is that on on the, the reading of the text, you can hear the words of Jesus say, want to deal with adultery? Deal with your lust. If you, want to deal with, if you want to deal with divorce, understand that it was not so from the beginning, and that brings in Matthew 19, but it's not in Matthew 5. So Matthew 5 just gives us a little taste of the conversation around marriage and divorce. We get the rest of it in Matthew, in Matthew 19.